In this film, I want to talk about plant interactions. Plants interact with the natural world around them in many different ways. They interact with insects that can be important for pollination. So think about some orchids that might need a particular wasp to carry the pollen around to fertilise the flowers. They might interact with birds and they sometimes act as seed dispersal agents. So emus and cassowaries are really important agents of seed dispersal in Australia. Plants also interact with herbivores and it's these herbivores that actually reduce the growth rate and perhaps the fitness of plants. So that's a really important interaction. But today I want to focus on how plants interact with each other. There are three key ways how they might do this. Firstly, plants compete with each other for resources and space. So competition is a really important plant interaction type. Some plants are parasitic on other plants. So this is a second form of interaction that we'll study out in the field. Thirdly, some plants facilitate the growth of their near neighbours and you'll get to understand where this happens and why. We'll introduce each of these concepts through a series of short films uh, in the field. And what I want you to understand is that these interactions are really important for determining the abundance and distribution of species and play a critical role in understanding why plants grow where they do. Here we are in the Botany Department's glass house on the campus of La Trobe University. And it's a really great place to think about how plants use resources and compete with each other. In this example here, I've got a single plant growing in a pot. But this plant is intercepting sunlight, it's extracting nutrients from the soil, and also extracting water. So what it's actually doing is depleting resources and making them unavailable for other plants. And that's a key concept in this idea of competition. When plants of the same species are growing together and extracting resources from the soil and from the air, in terms of light, we call that intraspecific competition. So here's an example of some grasses, all of the same species, competing with each other, intraspecific competition. Here's another example of that same phenomenon. These are ginkgos from Japan, and there's two individuals growing here, they're growing side by side, they're competing for the same resources. So another example of intra-specific competition. However, when different species are competing with each other, as we can see in this example here, we call that inter-specific competition. So in this example, we have a grass, we've got some lilies, and I've got a fern growing here, and they're competing for the same resources that this plant would be in its by itself. And this resource de uh, depletion actually influences how well they perform. So because they're competing, relative growth rates, flowering and seed production are often much lower than when grown alone. And this influences the fitness of these individuals. So what's the outcome going to be of interspecific competition? Well, a really important concept in ecology is called Gauze's Competitive Exclusion Principle. And put simply, what that says is, two species growing side by side can't coexist indefinitely. The better competitor will outcompete the weaker competitor, given enough time and given enough resources. So as a consequence, in any plant-plant interaction, given enough time, one species will outcompete the other. So that begs the question, how do species coexist together? So what constitutes a good competitor in the plant world? Well, here's an example uh, that might illustrate that to you. These are three annual plants. They only live for one year, and yet there's going to be reasons why one of these species would be the best competitor and one would be the weakest. Ecologists recognise three main ways that uh, plants are good competitors. One is fast growth rate. So if you can grow fast, that means you capture resources quicker than your near neighbours. A second reason for good competition is that you're tall. So if you're tall, that means you overtop your near neighbours and you capture the resources before they do, particularly light. 
A third reason that you might be a good competitor is that you deposit lots of litter. And litter de deposition is an interesting one because what it's not doing is preempting resource capture, but it's smothering near neighbours. So it's killing off the neighbours and allowing this particular plant, for argument's sake, to capture resources in the absence of com other competing species. In this example here, this grass is tall and fast growing. It's much more likely to outcompete using Gauss's competitive exclusion principle. This species here, called Arabidopsis, which is small, it grows a bit more slowly, and it doesn't really have much to it. So the interesting question you might want to think about is, this species here, which one would it likely outcompete in the long term? The Arabidopsis or the grass? So we've learned that fast growth rate, litter, decompos uh, litter deposition, and height are really important for influencing outcomes of competition. But in the natural world, lots of plants coexist with each other in close proximity. And one way they do that is because they actually are partitioning their niches. They're actually using different parts of the environment to, so they don't directly compete with one another. So how might the little annual plant Arabidopsis coexist with a shrub like this, Grevillea? Well, one way is to partition the niche by rooting depth. We know that woody plants are often quite deep rooted, so that means they're accessing deep nutrients and deep water. By contrast, little annual plants, their roots are near the top of the soil or near the surface. So they're only accessing nutrients and water close to the soil surface, so they're not directly competing for those resources. And if you think about how that might play out, if plants are growing in close proximity, but not directly using the same resources, they should be able to coexist, and that's what you see in nature. Another type of plant interaction that you're likely to come across is where one partner is positively influenced and the other is negatively influenced. This is called a parasitism. In Australia, you're likely to come across two types of parasites. One of them I can see behind me is called a mistletoe. Mistletoes grow entirely on other plants. They don't have their own roots. This plant has germinated on a gum tree and it then taps into the nutrients and the water of that gum tree. Clearly that influences the performance of the gum because it's taking away those resources from its own growth. The mistletoe is spread by birds and that's how it gets around the landscape. Because it's tapping into a host plant, it can put all its energy into growth of leaves and not have to worry about roots and stems. Here's an example of another parasite that you're likely to find in vegetation in southeastern Australia. It's a root parasite this time. It's called the cherry ballard, the exocarpus. In this case, the plant has its own root system and it taps into the roots of other plants to achieve water and nutrient gains. It's unlikely that these parasites kill their hosts. That wouldn't make sense in an evolutionary sense, that you'd kill the thing that actually allows you to grow. Because remember, for many parasites, if the host dies, it dies. But what it does, it makes that plant weaker and therefore subject to the effects of stress like drought. And so indirectly, the host can be negatively impacted by the species and cause its own mortality. The last important plant interaction is facilitation, where one or more individuals essentially facilitate the growth of another. So this is a positive interaction. Facilitative effects are more common where abiotic stress is high according to the abiotic stress hypothesis. So where conditions are favourable and plant growth is not limited by the environment, interactions are more likely to be competitive or negative. So plants compete for resources like water, light and nutrients. At the other end of the environmental gradient, plants might be constrained by their environment. So therefore they benefit from interacting with neighbouring plants especially if those plants can buffer them from the effects of the environment. Facilitative effects can occur below ground um, via root associations, but they're more easily demonstrated above ground where challenging environmental conditions are more obvious. Let's go and have a look at this in the field. I'm here at the foothills of Lake Mountain in the Central Highlands. The trees here are tall, there's high rainfall, the soils are deep and fertile, and plant productivity is high. So in this environment, 
Plants are expected to grow to the point that they're limited by each other, not the environment. So in other words, they're competing with each other for light, nutrients and water. Let's go to the top of the mountain now, to the stressful end of the gradient, and compare what we see here with what we see up there. I'm in a frost hollow here at Lake Mountain. In a frost hollow, cold air drains into the valley. It doesn't usually collect much snow and there's not much protection from winds and frosts. Plants here are indeed limited by their environment. They're not very tall, not super productive compared to those at the foothills of the mountains. And here, individual plants might benefit from close neighbours. A nurse plant, like a shrub for example, can provide the protection from detrimental effects of frosts and winds for smaller individuals sheltering under its canopy. Therefore, it's a positive, facilitative interaction between these individuals. And worldwide, facilitation is the overriding plant interaction in alpine environments. So there you have it. Biotic interactions really matter when thinking about the distribution of plants in the modern world. We've seen really good examples of plant-plant interactions that really influence which species are likely to be successful at a particular site. You'll recall we've seen negative interactions of competition. We've seen parasitism uh, in terms of mistletoes and root parasites. And we've also seen some examples of positive interactions, facilitation. These things all matter when thinking about why plants grow where they do. And the ecologist's job is to figure out which of those attributes, those types of interactions, are applying at the site that you're working at.